the way into the city and saith to the man, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to be? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Brother David, you pray. Thank you again, Lord, for being able to come to church, Lord, having a place to gather, Lord, with like-minded folks. Thank you, Lord, for the King James Bible. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to be able to um, show these truths to us in your word. Thank you, Lord, for a pastor, Lord, a preacher to preach these things to us. I pray you help us to receive them the way you have us to. Thank you, Lord, for uh, being in our midst, Lord, for enjoying all the spiritual blessings uh, that you allow us to enjoy daily. So much to be thankful, Lord, uh, for all the time, Lord. We just thank you for uh, all the things you do for us and give us continually. Looking forward, Lord, to going home and being with you forever. We thank you for the songs that we can sing today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for knowing that one day you're going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And we're going to see the dead in Christ rise, Lord, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with you in the clouds. Yes, sir. We're looking forward to that day, Lord. We're excited. Lord, we see the day approaching, Lord. We see the signs of the times of the world and things headed towards, uh, Lord, everything you, the way you said it would all play out. Yes. And so, uh, Lord, we're looking forward to being with you forever. We're looking forward to spending eternity with you, Lord. We're so glad the future truly only gets better for us. Yes. Just ask, Lord, you be with the preacher now, Lord. Bless him as he preaches the word of God, Lord. May it strengthen us when we go out the doors. Yes. Make us stronger, Lord, and better and better witnesses for you, knowing that the time is short. Yes, and uh, we just thank you for everything you do, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to preach a sermon. You may be seated. Thank you. Called In the Meanwhile. In the Meanwhile. Uh, right there from verse 31, it says, In the Meanwhile. And uh, that's the title of today's sermon, In the Meanwhile. And you'll have three points outlined there on your bulletin. As, uh, as we get to each of those blanks, you can fill it in. But uh, this phrase, this phrase, uh, meanwhile, uh, is used three times in your King James Bible. Three times you'll find those two words there mentioned, meanwhile, whereas the word meantime uh, only shows up once, okay? Now, there's a difference between the word meantime, or the words meantime, and the words meanwhile. The, the words, or the phrase in the meantime, is defined as until a thing comes to pass or takes place. In the meantime, we'll do this or that. That is until uh, such and such a time we're going to continue doing what we're already doing. The meantime is defined as a something being done until something else comes to pass or takes its place. But the phrase in the meanwhile is defined as two things happening simultaneously. In fact, uh, uh, we were watching a movie with the kids this week or we were hanging out doing something, I forget what it was and uh, Micah said in the meanwhile and uh, I said, that's right buddy, in the meanwhile and uh, he, he must have known what I, what I was going to preach because he used it exactly right. A lot of folks use in the meantime when speaking about two things happening simultaneously but that means until a thing happens we'll do this or that but in the meanwhile is two things happening simultaneously uh, they could be happening simultaneously by the same person in the same place, like walking and chewing gum. That's in the meanwhile. In the meanwhile, walking, you're chewing gum. One person doing two separate things at the same time. Or texting while driving. In the meanwhile, driving, you're texting. And so that's two things happening simultaneously in the same place by the same person at the same time. Or they could be happening simultaneously by separate persons in separate places. He was driving while she was texting. Or they were sleeping in Thailand while we were working in America. While some folks in the country are working, some are sleeping. In fact, in the New Testament, he talks about um, two people grinding. Uh, two, one, one person working while the other person's sleeping. Uh, the Bible talks about it being daylight here and nighttime over there. Uh, two things happening simultaneously in the meanwhile. Uh, in the meanwhile, it's day here. In the meanwhile, it's night somewhere else. Two things happening simultaneously in different parts of the world. Now, there are several things happening around the world simultaneously to us being in church this morning. There are many things happening in the spirit world that we cannot see in the physical world. 
uh, while we are enjoying the luxury of being gathered together in open and free assembly, uh, other parts of the country, whether it be night or day, aren't given that same kind of luxury. Uh, they are having to meet in, uh, in uh, uh, basements or they're having to meet in little rooms here and there and uh, they can't be out, they can't have the lights on. Uh, they don't have the uh, the freedoms that we have still in America today to be doing what we're doing here this morning in church. But in the meanwhile, someplace else, they're under persecution. They're under great scrutiny. And it should always do us good to remember that as good as we have it and as blessed as we are, in the meanwhile, somebody else ain't got it quite so good. In the meanwhile, of our rejoicing, of our being exciting, of our singing and shouting and praising God and having a good time. In the meanwhile, uh, there are others who are worshiping God much differently than we are today. Uh, they're worshiping God in secret. They're worshiping God in a sense of fear. They're worshiping God in a sense of uh, uh, we have to keep this thing uh, quiet and to ourselves because we don't have the same liberties as they do. But we're worshiping the same God. Yes, amen. And we're in the same spirit. Yes. And we are in the same body. And we are in the same Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we were saved by the same gospel. Amen. And we are blessed by the same things that all Christians are blessed by. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ being our God. Amen. In the meanwhile, what we tend to think about in the physical realm, uh, a lot of folks don't think about the spiritual realm. In the meanwhile of enjoying things in the physical realm, there are things happening in the spirit realm that we cannot see. Right. In the meanwhile of this or that, in the meanwhile, in over there in the spirit world, there's principalities and there's powers and there's spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, there's demonic things. There's devilish things. There's evil things happening that God cannot reveal to us or it would scare us to tears. Right. Amen. Amen. In the meanwhile, so I want to preach on this phrase, the meanwhile, as it appears in the Bible, and show you how we can be affected physically by those things that are happening around us spiritually. I don't know if you've ever experienced this or not, but everything could be just fine, and all of a sudden you get a sense of, woof. there's a presence there, whether it be a godly presence or an unholy presence, if you ever have come in contact with the spirit world, while in the physical world, you recognize it. And sometimes you'll all of a sudden become very discouraged or depressed or despondent or just very uh, 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 in your mind fearful and frightened. You're saying, what in the world is that about? That's the spirit world. Something is happening behind the scenes that you are under an attack and you don't, you don't do anything to deserve it. You could be in church right now, right now you could be sitting here right now and you are under a spiritual attack and you don't even realize it because in the meanwhile, things are happening simultaneously. Here in John chapter 4 verse 34, he says there, he says, Jesus saith unto him, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. You know, there's the meanwhile of service, the meanwhile of service. It's a pretty wild thing that while Jesus Christ came to do the work of the Father, there are plenty others that came to do the work of the devil. Right. Amen? Yeah. Uh, all the time Jesus Christ was trying to get things done, there was always somebody trying to interrupt the service. Yeah. There was always a Pharisee or a Sadducee or a scribe or a hypocrite that was just trying to find his little wiggle way in to disrupt what God was doing. There's a great example of that for good. When you see how the Lord filled the house there in Mark chapter, I think it's uh, 2. And uh, in the meanwhile of preaching on the inside of the house, there was four guys holding four corners of a bed, climbing up on a roof, fixing to bust the thing wide open. That's in the meanwhile. In the meanwhile, there's something going on here. There's something going on outside there, you see. And uh, uh, in the meanwhile, Jesus Christ, what's he doing? He's dealing with this woman of Samaria at the well. Isn't that what he's doing? Well, what were the disciples doing? They were over there buying meat in the market, weren't they? Mm -hmm. They go back and look earlier in the chapter. He says, I'm tired. I'm going to rest here a little while. And they got to go take off and go get some food. Because when they come back, what do they have? They got food with yes. them. Ain't that what they got? Yeah. So in the meanwhile of Jesus Christ dealing with a sinner who needs the living water, in the meanwhile of Jesus Christ working in the spirit realm, the spiritual world, 
his disciples are over there trying to buy up the best meal on meat <laughs> or best deal on meat. You see what I'm saying? You don't realize that while we are in church this morning dealing with the spiritual nature of mankind, there's plenty of folks out fishing, yeah. out boating, sure, huh? out cruising on motorcycles, yep. huh? Yep. out golfing. Yep. Uh, not everybody's thinking about spiritual things this morning because they're more interested in the physical realm, yep. the earthly realm, the carnal realm, and there are some Christians that say, you know what? I've got enough of the world all week long. I need to get a little bit more of God. Yeah, amen. I need a little bit more contact with the spirit world yeah. and the good kind of spirit yeah. rather than the bad kind of yeah. spirit. I need to go get some place <laughs> around that living water yeah. this morning. Amen. I ain't worried about what they're doing in the shambles and the meat market and the Hannafers and the Shaws yeah. and the and the Whole Foods and the Trader Joe's. or yeah. all. I'm worried about what can I get where Jesus is yeah, this morning. Amen. But in the meanwhile, yeah. in the meanwhile, at the same time as someone is serving the Lord through witnessing and testifying of all the things that God had done and revealed to them, others are only thinking about their next meal. Yep. Here's this woman of Samaria. And she says, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. What are you doing talking to me? Right. Meanwhile, the Jews have no dealings with Samaria because they're over there at the meat market buying food. Yep. So they've left town. They're like, see you later. We'll come back when it's all over with. And uh, when they come back, they weren't interested in what Jesus Christ was doing there with that woman of Samaria. Look, look when they come back, she's still there. Yeah. You see that? When they come back, and in verse 27, no man says, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? Mm -hmm. Then she leaves her water pot and she goes into the city and tells all the men there, come see the Christ. Come see the Messiah. Come see the promised one. Come see the chosen one. Come see the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what the disciples were worried about? Not what was he doing with that, talking with that woman. Lord, did she get saved? Lord, did she come to know you as her personal Savior? Lord, did she come to know you as the Messiah? No, no, they didn't even care about that. They're like, oh, Lord, we got you some food. We were out busy doing some work and buying some meat. Lord, aren't you proud of us? Look at us over here. They weren't interested in the spiritual things going on there. Now, I don't know about you, but if you saw Jesus Christ sitting down talking to somebody, wouldn't you want to know what they were talking yeah. about? Yeah. But you know how many folks aren't interested in what God says to yeah, you? You know you can leave church today and try to tell somebody about what Jesus said to you, and they're not interested in hearing about what Jesus said to you. You ever have that? Yeah. You go home and say, man, God spoke to my heart. God dealt with my heart. Well, do you know what time the game is on? What time do you want to have dinner? I want to talk to you about Jesus for a second. Yeah. I want to tell you about what God did for me in church this morning. They don't care about God. They don't care about Jesus. They care about their next meal or their next carnal or worldly or fleshly activity. I think about this woman here. She left her water pot. Now she came with some water needs. She had a water pot because she needed some water. But when Jesus Christ gave her the spiritual, she forgot all about the physical. She got filled up so much on the Spirit of God and what God said that she left the very thing that she needed to bring water back to the house. And she didn't even go home, but she went and told everybody about Jesus Christ. Why? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. She didn't get saved and then go back to what she was doing before she got saved. She got saved. She got gloriously and wondrously saved yeah. that she left the old world, the old life behind, the old carnal fleshly needs behind at least for a while and she had her mind set on the spiritual things. Yeah, so the disciples have become so accustomed to, well, this is just Jesus doing what Jesus yeah, does. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just church doing what church does. Yeah, yeah. They had forgotten what it was to have Jesus come to them and say, follow me yeah, yeah. Amen. and I'll make you fishers of men. Well, that blew their mind when they first heard it. Amen. Yep, right. Come see a man. What? Nathaniel, right? Come see the... They'd forgotten all about what Jesus Christ had pulled them out of. They became so accustomed yeah. Yeah. that they really missed out in the meanwhile 
while you're so accustomed to the everyday run of the mill, while you're so accustomed to knowing all that you know about dispensations and rightly dividing and all that stuff, there's somebody else in the meanwhile who's never heard the gospel yeah, one right. time. There are some in the meanwhile of you having all your knowledge and your expertise and your understanding and everything just so buttoned up. There are others who have never heard what you know. And they're struggling just to get there, to get something from God, but you're so puffed up in the knowledge that you miss out on the love in the meanwhile. I think about Mary and Martha. You know about Mary and Martha. In Luke chapter 10, verse 42. Actually, hold your finger in John. Look at Luke, look at Luke 10 real quick. Luke 10. Look at Luke 10, verse 42. Look at Luke verse 41. We'll back up. And Jesus answered and said unto her, See, in the meanwhile, he's got to go cook the food in there. See that? In the meanwhile. And I appreciate that he's doing that. I appreciate that. But that's 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 an exact that's a real example right there. That while we gotta be in here doing we're doing the spiritual things, he's gotta be out there cooking in the meanwhile, see? There's always things happening simultaneously. And this is a great picture of what just happened. Martha, Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. There are people that are careful and troubled about many things. But in the meanwhile, look at verse 42. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Amen. You see that? And there are some that are so focused on making sure everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. And in the meanwhile, there's somebody else that says, that vacuuming can wait. Yeah. Yeah. That box can wait to be packed. <laughs> In the meanwhile, now I am thankful that while there are others who are working to make sure we have a Sunday school and to make sure we have food and to make sure we have the chairs set up, that in the meanwhile, there are others who are doing what they're supposed to be doing likewise in the spiritual realm. So when we come together, everything works together nicely. I'm not elevating Martha uh, uh, or Mary ahead of Martha or downgrading Mary or Martha below Mary, except to say that Jesus Christ said, this thing was needful and she's chosen it. Yeah. And if you could have one thing over the other, always take the spiritual over the physical. Yeah, yeah. Always desire and do your best to get the spiritual over the physical. Yeah, You'll never, listen, God will never give you a hard time for sitting at his feet. Yeah. He might give you a hard time putting the physical over the, over the spiritual, but he might not. He might say, it's okay. We got, I understand you got to have your house clean. I get that. But he'll never give you a hard time for reading your Bible. Yeah, amen. He'll never give you a hard time for prayer. He'll never give you a hard time for going to church. Yeah. He'll never give you a hard time for passing out a gospel track or for standing out on the street corner or for helping somebody else with good counsel. He won't give you a hard time about that. Yeah. Ain't that a blessing? Yes. Yeah. There's some things we can do that God just ain't going to give us a hard time about. Yeah. In the meanwhile, um, I won't have you turn over. You can go back, back to John chapter 4. In Matthew 16 and in Luke 12, the disciples had mistaken the physical meat for the spiritual meat, just like they do here. Uh, here, if you go look at John chapter 4 again, uh, they, they, verse 31, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him. So while she's out running, telling people about Jesus. In the meanwhile, they say, Master, eat. But the Lord is more concerned with the spiritual over the physical. Mm -hmm. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. So when you only think of physical, you're only going to hear physical. Yeah. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. So here she is on the well. The disciples come. She takes off running, leaves her water pot, and goes and tells people about Jesus Christ. They say, Jesus, eat. He says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And where is their first thought? What's their first thought? They ask the question, hath any man brought him out to eat? Their very first thought about when he says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Their very first thought was on the physical things right. and not the spiritual things. Why? Because they had been more concerned about the physical than the spiritual. You know why a lot of folks don't get the preaching? 
They're like, I don't know what he's talking about this morning. <laughs> you know why? That's not a knock on you. Because you have had to spend the last five, six days in the world, in the physical realm, taking care of sores and blemishes and heartaches and backaches and, you know, headaches and cars and bills. Your life is so filled with the physical needs that when you come to church on a Sunday morning here preaching, it's hard to get the spiritual meat. It's hard to get the spiritual food you need because you're already thinking always about what to do next in the physical realm. I got this to do. I got that to do. So you're always asking, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? What's he talking about? What's that big deal? <laughs> and the disciples do this over and over again. Yeah. One time he says to them, uh, beware of the leaven of the, 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 the Sadducees. And uh, they say, is he saying this because we didn't take any bread? <laughs> yeah. And they just see the eating of the meal of the 5,000, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, they, and the Lord's dealing about the bread. They're like, Oh, it's because of... And he's like, did you not see what I did with the 5,000? You're always thinking about the real food, the, the physical food. I'm talking about the spiritual food, Amen. the spiritual meat. Amen. My friend, Brother Lord, Pastor Brother Lord this morning is preaching out of the same exact text, verse 30, uh, same exact thing, and he's preaching over there, are you a vegetarian? <laughs> and that's because there's people that just aren't interested in the meat of God's word. Yeah. They don't want the meat. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy, commanding to abstain from meat. There's a lot of places you can go this morning. My brother Mike had said, he goes, I, I, couldn't, I can't go to that church. Ain't nothing going on there. Yeah. There's a lot of places like that. There's no meat. Yeah. There's no Bible. There's no spiritual food and sustenance to get you from yeah. one day to the next. They're just puffing a bunch of hot air, a bunch of vegetables on your plate. But you need the meat of God's word to sustain you. Amen. To your next meal. Sunday to Sunday is a long time to go without the spiritual meat. All vain religions stem from the error of not discerning between the spiritual and the carnal. Go to 1 Kings 18. Give you the second one. In the meanwhile of service, while we're in service this morning, there's others that are just doing their own thing. In the meanwhile of you witnessing to somebody else. Uh, I gave you the example last Sunday night. We were in that Dunkin' Donuts, 1 Kings 18. And uh, while we were trying to witness to these two young girls, this uh, other man just kept trying to interrupt the whole thing. Yeah. And uh, make fun of it and say, I tried all that. In the meanwhile, I'm trying to witness. Don't you know the devil's going to send in his agents, yeah. his spies, yeah. his underlings, his hirelings, and try to destroy the work that you're trying to get done for God? That's always been the case. Uh, Paul says, when I leave, grievous wolves are going to come in and destroy the flock of God. Hey, in the meanwhile, you've got to be like your spiritual guard. In the meanwhile, of service. There's going to be others who are going to try to interrupt it and distract you. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18. We sang about this this morning. 1 Kings 18, look at verse 41. This is the contest with Baal, the, mount, the pro false prophets, and Elijah, God's prophet, up on the mountain there. And uh, Elijah, uh, by God's grace and mercy and power, wins the battle. And uh, look at verse 41, 1 Kings 18, 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, and put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down that the rain stopped thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. That first point was in the meanwhile of service, there are others who are interested in anything else but. The second point is in the meanwhile of storms. In the meanwhile 
of storms. You know, there could be a storm brewing mm -hmm. and about, about to break loose, and you don't know it. Yep. Yeah. You know that? Uh -huh. There could be a storm brewing and about, to, and about to break loose while you're doing what you're told to do. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Uh, you have Elijah, <coughs> who just had a great victory on the mountain, and you have Elijah commanding his servant to go do this or that, and at the same time, while that's going on, while he's fixing to take off and go do what God told him to do, at this very same time, he's in service for the Lord. In the meanwhile, a storm is brewing. Yeah. You can be 100% obedient, submissive, yielding, trusting God, loving God, serving God, doing God's will, doing God's work, and a storm is brewing yeah. that you have no idea about. You know, you could be in the midst of a storm right now and not even realize it. You know that? There's a lot of Christians that don't know what's going on. They wouldn't call it a storm. They would just say, oh, it's life. No, it's a storm. <laughs> it's a storm. Some say, well, it has to look like this for it to be a storm. No, 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 no. It's a storm. <laughs> it may not have broke loose yet on you, but it's a storm. There's people that are in the midst of a storm and not even realize that in the meanwhile of your storm... God is working all things together for your good. Amen. You know that? You know you can be in the midst of a storm and know you're in a storm, but not understand that while in the midst of a storm, God is working behind the scenes, all things together for your good, Romans 8, 28. You know you got a picture of that over there in Esther. There's a storm of brewing. There was a storm brewing on the horizon for the Jews and for Mordecai and for Esther. And the name of God is not mentioned one time in the entire book of Esther. God is not mentioned one time. So you would say, well, God's not in the book of Esther, but he is. Yeah, amen. There's a storm brewing, and there's a, there's a hard trial and hard tribulations and sufferings on the horizon, and yet God is behind all of that storm, all of that pent-up energy, all of that stuff there. God's behind it all. And he knows exactly what you need to get you through it. Amen. And he knows exactly what to give you when you get on the other side of it. Amen. See, why would God bring a storm like that when I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Well, these storms help expose your character and strengthen your faith. Amen. I was thinking about that in terms of those boys on a ship. Walk with God, see God do many miracles. They're on a ship and a storm comes. And what's the Lord say? Oh, ye of little faith. You see, there's a lot of character in Christianity when there's no storms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But when the storm is brewing, mm -hmm. and when you feel the pressure, when you feel the change in the air, when you feel the amount of oppression that's upon you, when you feel it all swelling up inside of you, how do you respond? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes God needs those storms to come into our life to expose them. I think of Job. Talk about a storm brewing on the horizon. God sent a literal storm to wipe out his family. Yeah. Yeah. And you read in Job there, he was an upright man, a man that feared God, eschewed evil. He was perfect in all of his ways, like Noah, the Bible says, upright, upstanding man. Why would God bring a storm upon him? To reveal a character flaw. Yeah, amen. Even at your best, there's still a character flaw. Yeah. And if you ever think that you've ever achieved some pinnacle of Christianity, that is your character flaw. Yeah, yeah. And God will expose it in your storm. Yeah. These storms help expose our character while also strengthening our faith. You don't have to do something evil for a storm to arise, but you do need to trust the Lord to get you through it. That's right. yeah. You don't have to do one sinful thing for God to bring a storm. Yeah. But when he brings a storm... You do have to trust him that he knows what he's doing. Yes, yes, and it's for your best interest. Yes. Say, what should I do while in the midst of a storm? What should I do in the meanwhile of a storm? Be patient. Yes. Be patient. He even says in James, have you heard about the patience of Job? Yes. <laughs> huh? <laughs> be patient. Be willing to learn. Yes. Yes. Learn what the storm was about. Yes. If we go through a storm and we don't learn anything in the process... Mm -hmm. It was, it was a waste of a storm. Yeah. Yeah. Not that God wasted it. You wasted it. Right. Yep. Amen. God's like, I'll just bring you another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And learn to listen. Mm -hmm. He says, let the Spirit, let the, let the churches hear what the Spirit says. 
You've got to learn to listen in the midst of the storm. Listen to what God is telling you. Listen to what God is trying to tell you through His Spirit, through His Word. Now I'll say this, there are some storms that are the, that are the result of disobedience. You have Jonah, don't you? Yep. I mean, you have the good version, Esther and Job and the disciples and a storm brood, even though they're with God and walk with God and doing everything right. you got Jeremiah. I mean, the Bible's filled with good men going through storms. But there's always Jonah, yeah. <laughs> who was God's prophet, was God's chosen man, but he just liked to push back against God a little bit. He liked to just see, could I get away with not doing what God told me to do? And yeah, you will for a little while, but guess what? There's a storm brewing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no doubt when he bought that ticket, he was thinking, well, surely they're going to be all out of tickets, and God will get me where I need to go. No, there was a ticket. Yeah. Then they're going to get on that. Well, surely the thing's not going to get off the ground. They're going to have to cancel the flight. No, no, no. They got off all right. He's out in the sea there. And he's thinking, I've made it. And all of a sudden, what storm is it brewing? What's that about? Disobedience. Yeah. And God says, yeah, not all storms are because you're doing good. Some storms are because you're doing evil. God had a storm brewing that would bring Jonah to a place of submission, repentance, and obedience. Right. Some storms are to get us on the higher ground. Yep. While we're already doing what's right, he still needs to get us on the higher ground yep. so we don't get complacent, yep. accustomed to everything being okay. Yep. But other storms, God has to bring to get us right with yeah, him. Amen. To bring us to a place of repentance where we do look inwardly and say, that storm is my fault. Yeah, I brought that storm on myself. And Jonah says that. They're rowing against it. They're trying to get out of it. And he says, it is I. Yep. Throw me overboard. Yeah. Let me just say this If you're in a storm Don't think it's because you've done some evil thing A lot of Christians get despondent that way They think well this is happening That's happening God's angry with me What have I done against God Well it's always good to look inwardly yeah, But if you can't identify anything That you've done knowingly It's not about a sin you committed it's about God knowing what's best for you down the road. Yeah, amen. Amen. Go to Romans chapter 2. In the meanwhile of service, there's others trying to break it up or try to keep you from serving God. In the meanwhile of storms, God's trying to strengthen you, build you up, or He's trying to get you to a place of repentance. But Romans chapter number 2 Romans chapter number 2, look at verse 13. This is the last time it shows up in the Bible. Look at verse 13. For, the hearer, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, here it is, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. The third one is in the meanwhile of secret thoughts. In the meanwhile of secret thoughts. In the meanwhile of service. In the meanwhile of storms. In the meanwhile <coughs> of secret thoughts. What do I mean by that? At the same time God is dealing with your heart, your thoughts can be making excuses as to why you don't or won't agree. Mm -hmm. You know, God can be dealing with you about the storm or about your service, but you know what your thoughts are doing? It's excusing the storm or it's excusing your lack of service or it's doing this. It's accusing others for their storms yeah. or their lack of service. You know, Martha was that problem. She saw what Mary was doing. She knew what she was doing. Instead of being satisfied in what she was called to do, in her thoughts, she was accusing Mary for not doing what she was doing. Listen, if God has given you something to do, if God has given you peace in your soul about the storm or about your service, don't worry about what somebody else thinks about it. Huh? Can I use a real example? 
if Brother Dave and his wife, if God has told them to go, it's not our responsibility to accuse or excuse them in our thoughts as to what God should be doing or they should be doing. It's about what God told them to do. Amen. But see, out here we'll say all the right things, but in here we're thinking something totally yeah, different. Amen. Huh? Yep. Well, they should be out here holding signs. Why? Because you are? Right. Yeah. Why? Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it because God has told you? Is God's convicted you? God's dealing with you? Or is it because of something else? Yep. Right. There's plenty of folks where God does deal with their hearts, but their thoughts, their intentions, their mind begin to make excuses or begin to go into the accusatory yeah. of harsh, cruel, unjustifiable judgment. Remember Hebrews 4, verse 12? Mm -hmm. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing, dividing of the soul and the spirit and the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, when your mind begins to slip into, when your thoughts begin to slip into excusing yeah. sin, excusing service, yeah. excusing storms, or accusing others, you know what we should do? We should get our minds and our hearts into the Word of God yeah. and see if God don't reveal something inside of me, yeah. which is why it's so hard to get somebody else. Yeah. I think I gave it to you Wednesday night. I said, more often than not, we are more judgmental against others yeah. when we don't judge ourselves right. first. Amen. I'll say this. There are plenty of people that look interested outwardly, but they are disinterested inwardly. Yeah. Yeah. I've dealt with that in soul winning. I had that with that girl Sunday night. I thought for sure she was going to get saved. Yeah. I was sold on her getting saved. Certainly she was going to pray a prayer because she looked interested outwardly. But inwardly, she wasn't interested in salvation. Yeah. I might have been able to trick her into a prayer, but her thoughts weren't my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Her ways weren't my ways. She was contrary. And I'm thankful she didn't just profess something. There are lots of folks that look interested in what you have to say outwardly, but inwardly they're disinterested. People may say they are sorry, but their thoughts are stubborn. Yeah. Yeah. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse from all unrighteousness. You know, not all confession is repentance. Mm -hmm. You know that? Oh, yeah. Not all confession is actually being sorrowful. Yeah. Yeah. Some confession is simply passing the time mm -hmm. or trying to get away with. No, no, if you're truly repentant, truly confessing that thing, you know what you'll not want to do? You'll not want to go back and partake of it. Right. Now, will you? Now, there's times where you will, but it'll vex you, it'll grieve you, it'll anger you, it'll make you sorrowful for that you have gone back on your word. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those that use confessions are just no better than a Catholic in the confessional booth that does his sins and then has them, you know, forgiven by the priest by praying some prayers. A lot of Christians fall into that trap. I'll sin today, confess it tomorrow, then sin the next day afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. That's no good. Yeah. But see, outwardly, just it's the inward that God's concerned about. Amen. People may say they forgive you, but their thoughts are bitter towards you. Exactly. You ever have that? Yeah. yeah. They'll say, I'm, they'll say, you say, I'm sorry. You mean it. From the heart, you mean it. You go to them and say, I'm sorry. I did this against you. And they say, I forgive you for that. And they walk away, mm -hmm. and then they come back around, and the next time you're in something against them, they remind you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, wait a second. You forgave me of that. Why are you bringing that back up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know why? Outwardly they forgave you, but inwardly they held yeah. a grudge. Yeah, sure. They're holding on to bitterness. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness, thank God, in Jesus Christ lets it go and don't bring yeah. it back up. That's right. yeah. Yeah. When he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when he says that our forgiveness is made pure, made clean by the blood of Christ, he don't go back into our old ways and bring up and say, well, you said you were sorry, and I saved you, but look at all the sins you did. Huh? I will remember them no more. Amen. Well, see, we're not like that. Thank you, Jesus. We, we look for the apology. We, ex we express the forgiveness but we've got an ace in the hole yeah. for the next time 
and we're not afraid to use it. Huh? What is that? That's the thoughts. Excuse me. Well, I don't have to forgive them. Well, I forgave them. They did it to me again, so I'm not going to forgive them. Nope. Or you get into the argument, and uh, I feel like I'm hitting on a nerve here, but I'm going to press on a little bit. Or else they get back in the argument, and they begin to accuse you. Yeah. Well, you weren't really this or that the last time. Yeah. Whoa. Now, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Isn't that what it says? Yeah. Yeah. It says it, man. If, you for, if, if somebody comes to you and apologizes, before you're willing to give that forgiveness, you better make sure you are... Truly forgiving them. Mm -hmm. Huh? People may say they care, but their thoughts are selfish. People may say they believe, they believe but their thoughts are contrary yeah. to what you believe. Yeah. Let me close with this. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3. I just want to close with this last verse here. In the meanwhile... In the meanwhile of service, in the meanwhile of storms, in the meanwhile of secret thoughts. And nobody's going to know your thoughts except for you and God. Mm -hmm. All we have to go is the outward appearance. God's man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You know what it says? Amen. So all we have to go on is the outward appearance. Mm -hmm. I'm glad y'all look interested this morning. <laughs> it makes preaching a whole lot easier. Amen. But just because you're interested don't mean... That you're actually going to follow through. Yeah. First Peter chapter three, and uh, look at verse one. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Watch it. Whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. You know what God's more interested in than anything else, man, ladies, church, is your heart. Yeah. In the meanwhile of looking one way outwardly, Inside, you can be full of dead man's bones. That's where God got over those hypocrites, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. He said, you whited sepulchers, you generation of vipers, you whited sepulchers. Outwardly, you appear beautiful unto men, but inwardly, you're full of dead man's bones. Again, all we have to do is the outward appearance, but God has the heart to look at. So what he's saying is, hey... If you're going to make the outward look good, could you at least make it match the heart? Yeah. Okay. Don't just put on airs. Don't just put on a show for everybody else who's watching you. Let it come from the heart. Yeah. Amen. I'm really, I'm not one that's going to look around and judge what people wear because it's not in my business, really. But what I care about most, and first, first and foremost, and most, is where's your heart for why you do what you do? Right. And if your heart is because you love God, then there's nothing that can be said against that whatsoever. Yeah, but make sure you're rooted and grounded in love first. Yeah, yeah. If a man says he loves me, but don't he keep my commandments, yeah. what kind of love is that? So what I care about is in the meanwhile of being in church, in the meanwhile of sitting here, where's your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Where's your hearts? Yeah, yeah. Heavenly Father, pray bless the message of God.